Live, tackling the topics everyone's talking about online. Share, engage, interact. This is News Feed Now. This is a, a very trying time, uh, I think it goes without saying, and uh, it's, 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 it's very difficult. I have not seen this type of uh, level of destruction uh, ever in, in uh, my experience here in, in Lee County. Uh, and that covers a span back, I know for at least 50 years, we have not had anything of this nature before. This is the big talk all around the South. Welcome to Newsfeed. Now we're going to have the most unique situation, the most unique place to get your news in the South, all from the comfort of your smartphone. All right, you just heard this man talking about it. A top story is weather here in the South, in the Southern United States. It's the deadliest day for tornadoes since 2011 in Alabama. At least two tornadoes took the lives of 23 people, including some children. Here's a look at the damage where the governor has declared a state of emergency. Crews are out this morning looking for those trapped under debris and those who are still missing. It's very devastating. It's probably the worst disaster that I've been involved with in my county here. I've been to several others around the state and worked uh, fatalities, but uh, for Lee County, I've been in the coroner's office over 30 years, and this is the worst mass casualty incident that we've had here that I can remember. Just across the state line in Georgia, at least 15 buildings were destroyed as the storm system moved east. I wanted you to take a look at some surveillance cameras right now uh, of this damage. It is it was an impressive storm as it came through. You can see the damage tweeted there by Austin Kellerman. Uh, interesting stuff again uh, that these things happened as now other parts of the state are dealing with some winter weather. Obviously, the Northeast, a lot of winter weather, but this is what happened Sunday. You see all the damage. You see this storm coming through. You see at the left part of your screen, if you're watching this, there the storm comes through. Uh, obviously, a very scary situation. Living in the South, this is something that we deal with, is tornadoes. And right now, they're starting to heat up. Of course, as we get to May, April and May, things will start to heat up again right now. But that warmer wet weather that's coming through, you know, here in this early to be spring, and I know I've talked to meteorologists, this is meteorological spring has started, so we're going to start to see this instability. That's what is going to happen. Storms, storms, storms. We're going to take a quick break on that. Our live reporter who is in Alabama is on television in Alabama, so we're going to give him a break doing that. When he is clear of that newscast, he will join us here on Newsfeed. Now that's hoping to come up in the next 10 minutes. All right, so let's go to Kansas for a moment. Our Gwen Bevel loves telling stories about the greatest generation. During World War II, members of the 106th Infantry Division were in Germany for only five days when enemy forces rolled in. Here's Gwen with more on a very unique POW. Our ears still ringing. And it's easy to see why, as John Mock describes what happened when that first shell hit. We dived in a, in a foxhole. Well, I didn't make, my foot didn't make it. There was a shell hit five feet on my left piece of metal went clear through the side of my foot. So with one only day, uh, one shoe, Mock says yeah. the soldiers started walking through the snow. He says they had no choice. They were out of food and ammo. Octoon, that means attention in Germany. We were on right square into them. And they were taken as prisoners of war. Mock says months and months went by in a camp before they were locked inside train cars. Not knowing who was inside, Allied forces blew up the train's engine. Pretty emotional day that day. 99 days after they were captured. Here come the 99th Division. Fattest GI we'd ever seen. He says when they figured out who they had discovered, they called for every ambulance in the country. We were dirty, we were filthy, we hadn't shaved, we were two walking skeletons. Mock says many of the prisoners couldn't even walk. He weighed just 105 pounds. The inside of my trousers, the inside seam is white with lice eggs. I could check, I could count all my ribs. I didn't have a stomach. I could touch my finger and thumb around my arm. Mock says he was also wearing a torn up German overcoat. Finally, we started speaking English. He said, we're Americans and we've been in a prisoner of war camp. Mock says the nurse then burst into tears. Here she come, bucket of warm water. Next time she had a brand new bar of soap, towel, wash rag, a razor, a metal mirror and a brand new pair of pajamas. What she brought next, he still vividly remembers. She had a coffee cup full of sliced peaches. You cannot believe how good that tasted. 
The next day, as Mock was yeah, taken right, to a hospital in off. France, his family would receive a telegram. He was no longer missing in action. He'd been a prisoner and had finally been freed. Mm -hmm. And Mock says even yeah. after all these years. It seemed like at night, uh, I've got to go through the whole thing again. All right, Gwen joins us now. Gwen, you have been tackling these stories for some time for us here on Newsfeed now, even though we've just started. We love coming up there to Kansas and talking about the greatest generation, those men and women who have fought for our country. Uh, one thing, you know, hearing him say Octung and what it means, uh, there had to be a lot of emotion in this uh, hearing from a man who was taken as a prisoner. It was incredibly emotional just sitting down talking to Mr. Mock. He mentioned that when that happened, when the Germans moved in, all they had, they were infantry, so all they had were their rifles. They had 8,000 German artillery pieces blasting them mm. at that point when he talks about diving in the foxhole and trying to get to safety. They knew that they were going to be taken prisoner. I can't even imagine being in that situation. And he mentioned how the piece of metal shot straight through his foot when he was wounded. He was walking on that foot with no shoe and was taken prisoner of war with that injury. Talk to me about hope. How much hope did he have during that time? Obviously, he was lucky enough to make it out, and without a doubt, we salute him and we stand up for him for what he did for our country. But how much hope did he have? Did he ever lose hope? I don't know that he ever lost hope, but he did tell me there were a lot of times they talked about how they were not going to make it out of that prisoner of war camp alive. Mm -hmm. He also talked about how the Germans who overlooked them during that time were either too old to be in the army or too young to be in the army. He said the guards did not torture them. He said that they were actually hungry too. He said at that point there wasn't anyone over there who thought they were going to make it home or back to their loved ones alive. He did talk about one very emotional story. I've had a lot of viewers reach out since this story aired and talk about the fact that on Christmas, he remembers the guards passing a little tiny bottle of schnapps to each veteran. <laughs> and then they started singing Silent Night in German. Yeah. He said they started looking at one another and the Americans decided, mm. you know what? It sounds the same no matter what language you sing it in. So I know that there were times in those 99 days where they found some comfort yeah. in the comfort of one another. But beyond that, like I said, he mentioned several times during the interview, Aaron, I didn't think I'd ever see my family again. All right, Mr. Mock obviously uh, needed something to eat and peaches is what he had. Does he still love peaches today? Was that something that he kind of took with him? He did take that with him. He also talked about the nurse you mentioned, or I mentioned in the story there, he had the big German overcoat. She didn't even know who she was dealing with when him and one other prisoner made it to her little table there at the hospital. And she burst into tears because she'd never seen a prisoner of war. I mean, John Mock is a big man. And to think that he weighed 105 pounds once they finally got out. He also talked about, Aaron, I wanted to mention when they were on the train, they could see through the top of the boxcar and they could see their own folks flying over and over and over. And he said, you know, they had the radar. They, they could see everything on the ground, but not knowing who was inside that's why the bombs were dropped mm. and, and thankfully it only blew up the train's engine and they were able to get free. He also talked about as soon as they were free from that train car, they went to the guard's car and ate everything inside. <laughs> I can't even imagine being that hungry or how you pass yeah. the days. And he, he mentioned 99 days and it was the 99th that saved them. Well deserved, without a doubt, we thank him for his service. He made this country what it is today. Gwen, thank you so much. Live for us you there bet. in Wichita, Kansas, we appreciate that. All right, so now let's get back to our top story. Weather is a big concern. I'm taking a look at Twitter right now and searching Alabama tornado and some of the images that you see, Tim, here on that second computer are just unbelievable. This is a fire department picture here uh, on the screen from looks like you fall. Alabama. These images are, are just something else. Again, we know two tornadoes came through Alabama, several more through Georgia. It is the big topic all around the United States. Of course, it's cold right now in a lot of parts of the South, but before it got cold, the deadly tornadoes hit Alabama. Kaylee Hartung has more on what's left behind and the work still left to do. A series of deadly tornadoes ripping through Alabama and Georgia, leveling homes and causing catastrophic damage across both states. Houses completely destroyed, uh, homes that just basically just slabs left where one stood a home. The tornadoes are the deadliest in years, with authorities telling reporters they expect the death toll to rise. The path of destruction tearing through Lee County, Alabama. Officials say one tornado appears to have traveled for several miles on the ground in one community destroying nearly everything in a half mile wide path. 
and sending dozens of people to the hospital with very serious injuries. I, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. This just came on so quick and changed so many lives that, I mean, I, it, it's really sickening to watch. Neighborhood after neighborhood in this Georgia town leveled. Roofs torn off the tops of houses, trees uprooted and blocking streets, cell phone towers knocked down. This whole area right here is, uh, is pretty much just gone. Looking out over this way, which is mostly trees, it just looks like uh, toothpicks broke just all through there. This porch, the only thing still standing from this home. Contents of one residence, uh, we know for a fact, was located over a thousand yards away. Uh, so we've got uh, a, a wide, very wide storm track that uh, went through the area. Families gathering anything they could find in the rubble to take with them to safety. These families have lost everything they have. In the midst of the chaos, some families reuniting with their pets. Is that your baby? And their loved ones. Oh, that's a sweet reunion, isn't it, right there? Granny's okay. Mm. Granny's okay. Kaylee, thanks. At least a dozen tornadoes hit this area. Widespread dis destruction. President Donald Trump tweeted out about the storm, saying to the great pe people of Alabama and surrounding areas, please be careful and safe. Uh, this is one thing here in this business. When tornadoes hit, we instantly go into any mode we can to get as much information. Number one, meteorolo meteorologists, I'm gonna kind of give you an inside look at what our news organizations do. I've been a part of several tornadoes, had to cover several tornadoes. And our meteorologists, first and foremost, they're going into forecasting mode, but they're also going into save you mode, right? So they're gonna be on TV, they're gonna be on your smartphone, they're gonna be on social media, and they're trying to give you information to save. Once it hits like this, then it's our job as journalists to go out into the field and show you these things and in some cases in some cases help reunite you and it's very difficult and, and again I've been out in the field and I've seen these things over and over again too many times to be honest with you but there are also the stories like you just saw at the end of Kaylee's story there where grandmothers are reunited where they're hugging loved ones I have a co-host here uh, in Arkansas on a, a morning show that I do and she was out uh, in the middle of central Arkansas doing a tornado coverage and she bent down and she found a photo and she took this photo to someone and said is this important to you and it was so important and those are the type of stories that we as journalists from going to protecting you to going to help you that's what we do. That's what we try to do. So, uh, you know, as you look at tornadoes, this isn't all about just giving you as much information as possible. We're very direct in what we're trying to do here. And this was a big one. 23 people lost their lives, some being children there in Alabama and Georgia. Uh, recovery will continue without a doubt. That is something that's going to happen. And as we get more information about how big that tornado was, of course, we'll bring it to you. I'm stalling a little bit now because we lost our live reporter who is in the field there, uh, who is actually uh, at a place where people were coming to stay. He was at a shelter for those who were affected by this. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to him, but no doubt our thoughts and prayers here on Newsfeed now go out to those people in Alabama and Georgia. Shifting gears, this is going to be a tough shift for us going from tornadoes to food, but in the South food, it's important. We always want to know where we can go for the best of the best in grub. Memphis has the barbecue. Oddly enough, Springfield, Missouri is known for cashew chicken. I bet you didn't know that. And if you want mud bugs, AKA crawfish, or as I call them crawdaddies, you got to go down to Louisiana. But with this wild weather we've seen, this Cajun fare is getting more expensive. Chelsea Jones is boiling up this story. Crawfish are the bells of the boil in Louisiana. I love crawfish. I love everything about it. For ULM student Sarthik Nupane, they've become one of his favorite things. What was your first reaction when you put your first piece of crawfish in your mouth? Wow. But those mud bugs don't really like the cold. Crawfish don't eat, they don't grow, they don't move, they don't catch as much. You can just hear the rain pour down outside of this crawfish joint. With all the rain the area has been experiencing and warmer temperatures moving in, you would think now you're boiling. But that's not the case. They can have all the rain they, they can get, but if the weather don't warm up, you don't get more sunshine, it's not going to change. It's a simple formula. Supply is low, demand is high, price is going to be high. In 2018, mud bug prices rose a dollar, and this season they're sitting near $6 a pound. 
But for crawfish lovers like Nupane, money isn't an object. Not really. <laughs> it's crawfish. It's worth it. As he wraps up his last year in town, he only has one goal. This semester, I'm trying to get all the crawfish I could because I'm either moving to Nebraska or California, and I do not trust crawfish out of Louisiana. And he has one thing to take with him. So will you consider yourself a Louisiana boy now? Uh, <laughs> I do not consider myself a Louisiana boy, but when it comes to food, yes. Proving despite the price and the weather, it's one staple that's here to stay. All right, Chelsea now joins us from Monroe, Louisiana. Chelsea, uh, all, right, all right, so I would have thought that mud bugs would be in extremely, not only high demand, but there's plenty of them everywhere. How bad is this weather affecting the population of crawfish? Okay, so when I was speaking with Mr. Cormier, he was saying, I mean, you would think, like you said, that they would be in abundance. However, yeah. he told me that the, a lot of rain isn't really the best all the time. He gets his crawfish from South Louisiana, um, and he says that they're in need of some sun. Um, you could do all the rain you want, but you're going to need some sun to yield the crop, a lot of crop. So he says supply has not been high, <laughs> but the demand is always through the roof. Well, yeah, demand is not going to go anywhere. I've lived into the South mm -hmm. much of my life, and uh, everybody wants those crawfish. They want a crawfish boil. They want to make sure the potatoes are down there. They want the, the corn on the cob, the onions. They want it all, right? Uh, all exactly. right, so is there a difference? And let me ask you honestly, you're living in Louisiana. Is there a difference between the mud bugs you get there in Louisiana compared to Mississippi, Alabama, all the way down to Florida? Well, I'm going to say yes. Now, listen, I'm a crab girl. I'm from Maryland, so okay. I don't know too much about the crawfish. But I will say, like um, you can hear from the guy in my package, you can't trust crawfish anywhere but Louisiana, mm -hmm. okay? So it's best here in the boot. <laughs> now, I mean, you've eaten crawfish, right? Yes, I have eaten crawfish last season. All right, what are you doing with the head of the crawfish? What is it? You pinch the tail you and pinch suck the tail the head? To suck the head. Come on now, you should know this. <laughs> you should know this. Steve, our I man know, behind the camera is going, what in the world here, Chelsea? You got to know these things if you're down in Louisiana. I'm learning. Okay, I'm learning. We'll, we'll, we'll let that one slide. But serious story, if there isn't many crawfish, do you guys expect a, a, a lot of folks to kind of come down and try to get as much as they can? Or are experts saying, look, this is part of the process. It's going to calm down the crawfish abundance. They're going to start multiplying real soon. Well, he tells me, you know, it's all up to the weather at this point. Yeah. You know, if there's more sun in South Louisiana, then we'll be fine. But he also says that he will always have a demand. He works with a good farmer or a cropper harvester, if you will, down there. And so he'll never run out. So the okay. demand will always be high. And he says it won't go down to about after Easter, but it won't be a problem. All right. So right now, about a dollar more a pound. I think a, a lot of folks who, who love that, that Cajun fare are going to pay that dollar more. Exactly. I mean, they said if it's $10, they're still going to buy it. Well, there you go. <laughs> Chelsea, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time Thanks. on Newsfeed now. We appreciate it. Well, this is the perfect transition from crawfish to Mardi Gras. Tomorrow is Fat Tuesday, one of the biggest southern days of the year. From beads to king cakes, this celebration will be a big one. Plus, who's going to get that little bitty baby in the king cake at your office party? Well, I did some research. Whoever does is going to get l good luck. They're not having the next baby. That's what I always thought. And they also have to buy next year's king cake, so make sure they do that. Let's get a preview with our Caroline Marcello. To have this honor to be able to represent Xanadu and all of our military in the United States of America in the Xanadu United We Stand Ball has been a blessing and an honor. And to be able to do it with Greg as a retired Army veteran has just made it ten times better than I ever could have ever imagined. Queen Stephanie Fake and King George Salou reign over the crew of Xanadu this year as they honor veterans and their families. And I'm just so humbled to be their king and we've invited so many veterans from World War II, Korea, Vietnam era, to the Cold War, uh, Desert Storm, to the present uh, Iraq War. We brought veterans from all over and some active duty guys to sit in because it's a celebration of all of them and the men and women that have served. This year's decor and costumes showcased the red, white, and blue and magnificent Mardi Gras fashion while paying tribute to those who served. With all the active duty military here and the veterans, 
a lot of them are going to be in their military dress. Um, so that's going to make it even more special. But it's really an homage to what they've done and the sacrifices that they've made and, and some really nice surprises that you're just going to absolutely blow your mind. All right, Caroline now joins us not live from Louisiana. Lafayette, Caroline, good afternoon. Welcome to Newsfeed. Now, how excited are the folks down in Louisiana for the annual tradition that is Mardi Gras? Yeah, good afternoon. Today is known as Lundy Gras here in Louisiana, right. the day before Mardi Gras. So we have really been going big and celebrating. It's been a long Mardi Gras season, but I had so much fun Friday night at the Xanadu Ball. Um, a really amazing ball, almost 2,000 people in attendance that night. So it was a big time. <laughs> so what can we expect here a little bit north of you in, in the southern United States? What is the big things that we need to be prepared for for Mardi Gras coming up tomorrow? <laughs> Well, Mardi Gras tomorrow, we are getting ready for all of our parades. We have two bitty, um, pretty big parades coming up, the King's Parade and the Queen's Parade here in Lafayette. So all the barricades are out on the streets right now. Um, it's cold. It, we woke up this morning, and it was freezing. So we're having a cold Mardi Gras this year, but uh, it, it was a long Mardi Gras season, two months of celebrating, so really wraps up these next two days. Um, all the reporters tomorrow will mm -hmm. be out at um, our smaller Mardi Gras celebration. So I'm going to um, a town called Laurelville because everybody's Mardi Gras celebration is a little bit different. So it's really interesting to get down to the smaller rural areas and see how they really celebrate as well. All right, who's bringing the king cake this year? Oh, well, we've been eating king cake almost every Friday for, for the entire every season. Every Friday? But how many babies y'all got down there? We have a lot of king cakes. The king cakes never stop. Um, okay. I actually stopped into a local store this past weekend, Saturday morning, and it was like eight o'clock and almost all of the king cakes were gone. So ma make sure to get your king cakes early in the morning. And and we do ship. There are a couple places in Acadiana that ship uh, out king cakes. So uh, go to klfy.com and you can get a king cake wherever you want, really. You got a, you got a good Cajun <laughs> accent for us, Caroline, before we go? I So I am from a place called Thibodeau, which is about yep. two hours from Lafayette, and I did um, family hometown Mardi Gras yesterday. And it's funny because I go home and everybody's like, oh, we think you have an accent, but um, I did down to Bayou Mardi Gras yesterday. My, okay. My, Louisiana accent isn't that good. Oh, you got to have a little bit of a Cajun accent. <laughs> a I mean, you got to have that. You got to get all that down in that ditch. No, I mean, May down there in Thibodeau, Louisiana? In Thibodeau, Louisiana, yes. Okay, that is now. Where I'm from. So I drove in this morning, a uh, two hour drive, but it's Mardi Gras is so fun. It's different everywhere and, and really family oriented in a lot of places, which people don't, don't get. Everybody oh, yeah, just everybody thinks, thinks about Bourbon yeah, Street. No, La Mardi Gras, but Mardi Gras really is um, a tradition here and, and one of my favorite times of the year. <laughs> all right, Caroline, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time here yeah, on yeah. News Feed. Happy Mardi Gras, y'all. Uh, all right, see you guys. All right, that's our show. Wraps it up for today. Tomorrow is Fat Tuesday. Go get your king cake and enjoy yourself. We'll have a big celebration right here on Newsfeed now. Tomorrow, 11 o'clock, tune in on your smartphone. See you then.